So an outline of my talk today, I'm going to try and say a little bit about market laws and then go on to talk about a model of systemic risk and lay out a vision of uh, how I think this could be done much better in the future. Um, I'm going to somewhat accelerate my remarks because uh, we're a bit over time. But um, I, I wanted to begin by saying as a physicist, I'm always surprised that economists often say that, that economics is modeled on physics because as a physicist, it doesn't look anything like physics to me. And, <laughs> And uh, in fact, this point was made in Philip Murawski's book, uh, More Heat Than Light. Um, there, are just, there are strong differences between the two fields. Uh, the styles are completely different. Um, and the nature of the theory that's, that's been constructed is different. Um, can I advance my slide? No. Can you give me the next slide, please? I don't, oh, maybe I'm using the wrong, I may be using the wrong thing. We've got several controls here. Um, I wanted to begin by, by George Soros in his uh, remarks. Uh, first of all, offered, said we shouldn't pull punches in, in uh, perhaps disagreeing with what he says. He said there is no such thing as, he doesn't believe there is such a thing as universally valid laws of social systems. And so I made a list here of, of things that are, at least have been proposed as laws. Now I think the difference in what we mean may have to do with a fine print behind the terms universally valid. The ideal gas law in physics, for example, is, is that universally valid or not? Well, when a gas is an ideal gas, it follows the ideal gas law, but lots of gases aren't ideal gases, and if you change the circumstances, they may stop behaving like ideal gases. And I think that's the nature of the kind of law you expect in financial markets or economics in general, in contrast to things like Newton's laws or gravitational laws or quantum mechanics. I don't think we're going to find that kind of theory uh, in economics. And in fact, I think one of the differences between physicists and e economists, physicists, once you get out of the very pure fundamental physics, physicists are used to making lots of approximations, to making phenomenological models. Theories are only in service of the empirical phenomena that, that they're designed to talk about. Um, so this list I'm giving you here, which I'm not going to go over, involves things that are in various stages of being proposed as laws. They're probably not universal valid in a strong sense, but I think they might be in a weak sense. So I want to go on to say, talk now about systemic risk. Now, I should perhaps begin with a definition, since I don't think we've had one yet. I would say that systemic risk occurs when individual actors unknowingly create risks through their systemic interactions with each other which they're often unable to model or have no awareness of. And this doesn't just happen in financial markets. For example, if you go through mass extinctions, I think you can argue some of the mass extinctions that happened on the planet were systemic risks. Others were not caused by systemic risk. If, uh, say, in the Cretaceous period, when a meteor hit the Earth and the dinosaurs were driven extinct, I wouldn't call that a systemic risk. I mean, that's just bad luck. And, you know, if we have a nuclear war, financial markets are probably going to suffer a lot. But that's not really a systemic risk, at least for financial markets. It might be for society as a whole, depending on the way it was caused. Um, on the other hand, uh, about a billion years ago, there was a major mass extinction when a new organism emerged, cyanobacteria, and began to do photosynthesis and turn carbon dioxide into oxygen and basically poisoned all their colleagues as they turned the, the Earth from a reducing atmosphere to an oxidizing atmosphere. Now, it also brings up another point. We may not want to block all such evolutionary transitions. Um, had that not happened, we would very likely not have multicellular organisms. And so at least in wet retrospect, I think we're probably all voting for that particular Schumpeterian event. And, um, and I think in general, we need to worry in, in damping out systemic risks or in damping out risks in general, trying to smooth out the economic growth curve, we may be paying a penalty by not letting, by throwing Schumpeter out with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, now there's several other, I, I, I think the most interesting systemic risk, and the model I'll show you illustrates this in financial markets, come when you have a system in which efforts to reduce risk actually end up causing risk. And I'll give you an example of that. Some other examples have been given by Kars Hamas's group and Matteo Marsili and his collaborators, who, by the way, showed in their model how the use of derivatives, as the market gets more efficient, it also becomes more unstable due to the action of the derivatives. Um, now, the first thing one should, should ask in making a systemic risk model is to ask about the unconditional model. And let me just say that the unconditional empirical data speaks pretty strongly to say that market returns have power law tails. 
Um, now, this elementary fact and the need to explain it has not been properly appreciated by economists uh, in several dimensions. Um, shortly after the time of the LTCM failure, one of our employees at Prediction Company had to happened to have lunch at a conference with somebody from LTCM, and they were moaning about having hit a, I forget the number now, X standard deviation event. And our employee said, you mean you talk that way? Uh, because that's not the right way to talk about power law distributions. Uh, the fact that it's 10 standard deviations says nothing. Uh, you really have to think about it as a power law, and you have to model their, your risk that way. And PS, we were using much lower leverage than they were. Um, the other... Um, let me just say that I think power laws permeate economics. It's one of the big mysteries. And yet there's also been little interest in it from a theoretical, theoretical point of view. This was driven home to me in a conversation in 2000 with Richard Roll, who's a prominent financial economist, who said, well, you know, this problem is not interesting. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, because we know why it happens. It happens because markets are just responding to external information. And if we have power law tails, it's just because the information arriving in financial markets has power law tails. P.S., this is a problem for sociologists or climatologists or somebody else to figure out. It's, it's not our problem. It's just, it's just exogenous stuff. Um, well, I don't think in view of what's been happening, I think less and less people believe that. These the risks that make up that tail are generated by the system itself interacting with itself. It's George Soros's reflexivity principle in one of its many guises, which PS in physics, I mean, we just saw an example of hysteresis by the previous speaker. That's a great example of historical dependence in a system, path dependence. These things are around in many other uh, domains, not just in social science. Um, now, I'm gonna now show you a, a systemic risk leverage model that generates power law tails. Um, in this model, we assume we have long-only value investors, Warren Buffetts, okay, people that, that believe they can value what a company's worth. When the company's undervalued, they go out and buy it. We also have um, noise traders that blunder their way along. They kind of vaguely know whether the system's undervalued or not, and they're randomly somewhat tracking the true value. And um, the funds are going to try and exploit the noise traders in this model. They do exploit the noise traders in this model. And there's a knob that we can turn, which has to do with how much leverage the regulators let the funds use. And so we can turn that, that knob up and down. And what we see in this picture that I'm showing you here is what happens to the returns as we go from a world without leverage, which is the red curve here, to a world with leverage, which is the blue curve. And so what I'm plotting is the return that is how big are the crashes, or how big are the downward movements of price. And so we're plotting the probability that a given return is greater than some threshold R. We're plotting it logarithmically on this axis against it, its, sorry, we're plotting the logarithm of R on this axis against the logarithm of the cumulative probability on this axis. And what you see is that when we switch leverage on, we go from, from this a uh, normal distribution here, corresponding to a world dominated by the actions of the noise traders, to this blue distribution here where we see a region where we see a straight line corresponding to a power law, corresponding to heavy tails because the large events now go from being 10 or 15 percent to being 25 or 30 or even 50 percent. And so we see a dramatic change in what's going on. And in fact, it turns out when we put in realistic leverage levels, uh, in fact, Seven turns out to give us an uh, exponent of three, which is actually what's observed in financial markets, which is probably somewhat lucky, but it does show that this model is at least in the right ballpark. To look at this in a different way, we also see what's called cluster volatility, which is actually what's driving these heavy tails. So whereas without leverage, we see a more or less normal set of fluctuations, with the leverage in there, we see sharp downward spikes corresponding to the crashes that occur in the market, the red triangles here are indicating places where the investors are fully leveraged, and we see these bursts of volatility following these large spikes. Again, much like what we see in real markets. Now, um, let me just show you a, a little bit deeper breakdown of what happens during one of these crashes. Here we see the wealth for three different funds. The top fund here, the blue fund, is the most aggressive fund. They're buying up aggressively mispricings when they occur and taking more leverage. The, um, the red fund here is the least aggressive fund, and what you see is during good times, the most aggressive fund is gaining in wealth. 
So what does that mean? That means in an evolutionary sense, the average leverage is creeping up, just like what we saw in the recent crisis. These are showing the bursts of the, the actual uses of leverage. This is what the noise traders demand is. Um, this is um, the, the actual price that you see. And what you see is the price goes along. Normally, the value investors are, are buying whenever the asset tries, uh, starts to get underpriced, keeping it from ever getting very underpriced. But what happens here is that the leverage builds up to a critical threshold and there's a crash in the price. And what happens during that crash is just the kind of feedback loop that uh, Marcus Brunemeyer was mentioning in his talk. Namely, the, um, the funds are heavily leveraged. The bank, the, the, there is, there, for some reason, happens to be a small downward glitch in the noise traders' demand, although, as you can see, the the, the differences are shown here. There's nothing particularly important happening when this crash occurs. There's a downward glitch. That causes the leverage of all the funds to go up. When their leverage goes up, the banks tap them on the shoulder and say, well, you can't go above a certain leverage limit. You need to pay the loan back. So what do the funds do? They sell. So as normally they're buying in falling markets, they're now selling in falling markets. That drives the price down at a systemic level and it causes the crash. So it's a nonlinear feedback mechanism. The systemic nonlinear amplification suddenly kicks in and you get a big crash. And what happens in the course of that is even when you actually don't get the crashes, even under um, normal circumstances, they're always amplifying these fluctuations so that whereas the noise traders are their difference from step to step looks like this. There's a little bit of structure in there. It's enormously amplified into the actual price movements that are happening due to this nonlinear feedback mechanism that's going on all the time. And in that sense, it differs from the, the simple thing that George Akerlof said in his first <coughs> explanation of the crisis today. It isn't just that they're taking too much leverage. It, this, this leverage is causing a systemic failure. And I'll argue in a minute that um, they could do this, actually, and well, I'll just say so now. You could have this happen, and if you just change the rules about the way the loans get paid back, you could alter the way this happens. Um, in fact, if instead of having them sell the asset and pay back with money, you just had them return the asset to the bank, then they wouldn't be causing all the impact because it's actually the friction is the force that causes price to move. The two things are one and the same. It's another thing that I think often is not quite driven home. Um, so I think I've more or less covered this. The reason you're getting heavy tails is because this leverage is both squeezing the center of the price distribution during normal times when things are going right, but when you actually have the margin calls, it's stretching out the distribution and actually amplifying it. Um, I just want to emphasize it's risk control that causes the problem. It's not just that people are taking too much leverage. If you had this alternative mechanism that I proposed, we wouldn't see these kind of effects. You'd have to go to much higher leverage before you'd start to see nasty things happening. Um, so what is needed? Now I'm going to jump from here to a broader set of remarks about economics, and I, I need to wrap it up soon, so I'm going to make these very brief. There's been a lot of, of discussion in the press that what we really need to do is deal with behavioral, more realistic behavioral assumptions. I'm in full agreement with that. But I think that's just part of the problem. I think the other big part of the problem is that we need to really treat the economy as a complex system. We need to be able to model all of its components. And in the story I just gave you, for example, there's nothing particularly behavioral going on other than investors like to buy underpriced assets. That's pretty basic. It's these mechanical effects of the way we've actually built the system. It's the institutional effects that are mechanically causing the problem. Why? Because we haven't thought through what our institutions are actually doing because we're not thinking about things at a proper systemic level. And, you know, I, if there's some questions, I, I would say a, a better model of at least part of what ought to go, ought to go on in economics is, is climate modeling where there are 40 to 50 large-scale climate modelers, these models organize the whole field. And in economics, I mean, this is where the climate modelers put the rubber to the road, and when they first did it, these models failed miserably. These models do much better now. And by the way, I also run a sustainability school, and if you benchmark climate models against the economic models of climate change, there's no question about which is better. These are far, far better. I, I, I believe these models. I don't believe much economic models about what happens. Um, 
Duncan Foley and I have written an essay critiquing the, the Lucas critique. Actually, we agree with the critique. We just think the medicine that was imposed was the wrong medicine, and one needs to get rid of dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, or not get rid of them, but in, in addition to them, also make more robust models that actually can model effects like liquidity and systemic effects and actually treat the economy as a complex system. Um, I think this needs to be done on a substantial scale, and I am going to skip over to my next to last slide here and just say, I mean, I think there needs to be some evolutionary changes in the epistemology of economics. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with the way theories are formulated and tested. I think economists should be pushed to make more sharply falsifiable hypotheses, to make more contact with practical problems, ask new questions, and open it up to more influence from the rest of science because at least as an outsider, I find economics very insular. And I would also argue for a bigger toolkit. Right now, the neoclassical toolkit is pretty limited. But you know, if, you approach, if you're approaching a new problem, you want a toolkit, it, you want it to have hammers and saws and screwdrivers, and maybe for some purposes you even want a fancy milling machine. You, know, you really want to have different tools, and you use those different tools when you're trying to do different things. And I think the, the solution set in economics and the approach has gotten much too homogenous. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you.